I am so happy to see you here and so excited about this Cape Fear Future product that we've been working on for over a year. Um, so the scorecard unveil is very important to us. We hope it's going to prove to be very important to the community as we move through making decisions on how we spend money and policy decisions, things like that. Um, I also want to welcome the Leadership Wilmington class. They, are, they have a full day session today. They decided to start it with us. So welcome Leadership Wilmington. We appreciate you being here. There were a cast of characters that helped put this scorecard together. It was not easy, and it took a very long time, and I want to introduce many of them that are here. Um, first, at the head table, the two guys that really shouldered a lot of the weight on the scorecard, Hal Kitchen, who's the Cape Fear Future Chair, was Chair of the Scorecard Task Force, and Attorney McGuire Woods. He doesn't really work for them. He works for the Chamber, mostly. <laughs> All billable hours, of course. But Hal, thank you. Adam Jones, Dr. Adam Jones is an economist with the Swain Center at UNCW. Um, let's see, how do we say this so we don't say it that way? Uh, Woody is the old Adam Jones. How about that? This is, this is your you economist, but we appreciate all the work he did. Our Chamber's Executive Committee was involved, and Chris Boney, as you know, Chamber Chairman this year, um, has done a spectacular job leading them through making decisions on the scorecard. Chris is with LS3P, and he has spent a lot of time this year with the Chamber. We appreciate it. Um, Beth Schrader with New Hanover County was awfully involved, and John Nelms with Duke Energy, and Glenn Harbeck with the City of Wilmington, Robin Spinks with Greenfield Development, Dean Burris and Tom Porter from UNCW Cameron School of Business. And we have this great intern named Ryan Beckner, and he was awfully involved too. So if you would join me in thanking them for their really hard work. I do want to remind you, Cape Fear Future is about five years old. We've been really involved in a lot of projects throughout the community. If you look on page 14 of your scorecard later, you can read about some of the most recent activity from Cape Fear Future. But there were some people that had to help us get Cape Fear Future started, and a lot of that was through their investments. And I just want to mention three major, major investors. I don't think but one's here, so I'll really embarrass him. But Jack Bartow at New Hanover Regional Medical Center was one of the first calls we made, and he said yes without hesitation. So thank goodness for Jack in New Hanover. George Roundtree did the same thing. I was hoping he'd be here today so I could pick at him a little bit. You know, when George loves something, he really loves it, and, and he's really appreciated working with Cape Fear Future. And the one I'm going to embarrass is Ronnie McNeil with Liberty Health Care. Um, Ronnie was also stepped right up and said, of course, we really need to do this for our community, and he has been so involved, hands-on, um, all the way through the process of Cape Fear Future. On the back of your program is a list of all the investors of Cape Fear Future, so if you want to review those. Today's event, we have key sponsors, and I want to thank them first and let you know who they are. Duke Energy, Carolina Bay at Autumn Hall, bb and and Corning. I, I mentioned Chris Boney as our chamber chairman this year with LS3P, and I have to tell you, I, I don't think you know before you become chairman of the chamber how much time it takes. Um, when I talked to Chris yesterday, he was driving back from Greenville, and he's really had an incredibly busy year, which is lovely for us. That's kind of the canary in the coal mine. People are designing this before they're going to build. We've got new businesses happening. Um, but Chris has had quite the exciting year. He's uh, sold his house. He's had to move into an apartment as he renovates another house. He's got three kids. He's doing carpooling and designing buildings, so he's probably tired. I think he got home last night about 8 o'clock. So I am honored to present my chairman this year, Chris Boney, LS3P. Well, thank you. Um, good morning. Um, good morning. I'm really not that tired, so don't, don't let her tell you that. Um, I'm going to speak very quickly because I know we've got um, a big um, agenda ahead of us, a lot more exciting things to hear than, uh, than listening to me. Um, I actually got in a little before 8 o'clock last night. Um, I went down and uh, Mitch Lamb, my assistant basketball coach, helped to cover practice for me and then he and I took our boys to a UNCW basketball game. And let me say, I'm wearing my UNCW tie today because, um, you know, what a great institution we have in UNCW. I mean, I, it struck me as I was looking through the bios and, and looking up here at the dais and looking out here in the audience, it's, it, that um, institution has touched so many of us in so many profound ways and does such a great job for our, uh, our community in general. So please go to the basketball games and support the team. I was there last night, and it wasn't totally full. It's a great time, and, and uh, we really need to support that institution. 
Um, while I was there, uh, Mitch and I uh, were standing by the concession stands while our kids were buying candy bars or something that their mothers didn't want them to have. And there was a, a, a plaque right there with all the names of the donors that gave the air conditioning system, which I, I don't know, was 25, 30 years ago or something like that. But it's pretty interesting to look at because it really struck me to look at some of the names on there and see who is no longer with us. And it made me think about today, and really the theme that I presented earlier this year uh, was about past, present, and future. You know, in order to move ahead, you've got to know where you came from and where you are today. And that's really what today is about. These guys are going to tell, us, tell you about uh, where we are. Uh, they're going to give you a lot of great data. You've got to understand the data to know which way you want to move forward. Um, after this meeting, y'all are the future. When you move out of this room, you're the people that make Wilmington prosperous. You're the ones that generate the economy here. Uh, you're not the ones that necessarily make it successful. There are a lot of other people behind us that do the day-to-day -day work that make us a great community. But you're the ones who really help to have to be leaders in the community to push us forward. So please remember that when you go out here. This is a time to celebrate. It's a time to think positively about our future. Because we have a great future and we have a great present uh, right now. We also have a great past, and um, some of the names on that list that uh, uh, came before us, I just want to take a moment to, to remember, and one in particular I know that um, passed away yesterday, and those of you that <clears throat> knew Dr. Williams know what a great man he was. So um, I don't know that if any of the Williams family are here, why don't we just take a minute and give a round of applause to a great man, Dr. Burt Williams. We stand on the shoulders of many great men and women that came before us, and there are many great men and women in this room. So I applaud you all for taking the leadership role and for helping us to move forward. So why is this scorecard important? Um, again, it's a tool to help us look forward into the future. Um, when we took five, five years ago, we took a trip down to Charleston with a chamber uh, trip to go listen to them and, and hear some of the things that made them successful. We followed it up again this fall with a, with a follow-up trip. But what struck us five years ago that really was the impetus for the discussion that led to the scorecard today uh, was their alignment. Um, the business community and the, uh, and the uh, public sector were really aligned to their mission. And part of that came down to their scorecard. And uh, we have taken uh, a few liberties with that, and, and, and uh, I won't say we've copied them, but we've used some of the things from that that uh, we thought were successful. Uh, we're not Charleston. We don't want to be Charleston. We're, we're, we're better than Charleston. We're Wilmington. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, but, but we can copy you know, things that are successful and, and uh, use a little liberty to steal things uh, when we can. So uh, that's uh, uh, led to the today. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have a great team here. And uh, believe me when I say that I have done very, very, very little of the work here. These two gentlemen here and Connie and the Chamber have done a, a, a tremendous job taking us to this point. So thank you all for being here. Uh, please celebrate the past and think about the future. Take us forward into next year. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to uh, the esteemed Hal Kitchen to take us forward. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, let's get started. Um, before we dive into the, the document itself and the details, we thought it would be a pretty good idea to talk a little bit about where this idea came from, when, what was the genesis of it, uh, what was the motivation behind it. Uh, and in thinking about that, I think I'd have to look back to the 2012-2013 time frame when um, we were everywhere uh, around the country coming out of the recession. Um, I know that a lot of these, the people in this room were talking to other people and to themselves sometimes about uh, how we were doing as a region, whether we were coming out of the recession, and if so, whether we were coming out of the recession as uh, robustly as other communities around the country. Um, we at the Chamber were monitoring that uh, pretty closely. We were looking, trying to look at hard data. Uh, in particular, uh, employment levels. And we knew, um, as we've talked about in this room before, that our employment levels here in Wilmington were still dropping at a time when uh, about 95% of the other MSAs around the country uh, were seeing month-over-month uh, -month annual job gains. Um, meanwhile, uh, out in the community, in the media, uh, there were mixed 
messages out there, um, this little piece of data would come out and people would say, well, this means we're doing great in Wilmington. Another piece of data would come out and people would say, this means we're doing terrible in Wilmington. And it just got very confusing. And so as we reflected on that fact, we thought maybe it would be a good thing for the Chamber and Cape Fear Future to be involved in helping the community set a little bit of a baseline. Um, let's, you know, maybe we can help the community understand it. Although these aren't the only metrics we're going to look at, here are some pretty important metrics. Here are some pretty important outcomes, and here are some of the inputs that go into that. And that really was the genesis of the scorecard idea. Um, we preferred not to reinvent the wheel if we could get away with it. So when we looked around the country to see if anybody else was doing this sort of thing, we found out that, sure enough, a lot of other communities were. And we set about to figure out what it was they were doing, how they were doing it, and what of that we could copy. Um, so that's, uh, that's how we got to where we are today. So this background I've mostly talked about already, but uh, I, I, this, this shows that uh, our, our, our focus going forward was going to be on objective data. Um, and our goal is to try to use the same data from year to year. Uh, we may add things at some point. We're going to try not to subtract things. We needed to measure ourselves relative to our peers, um, not just sort of how's Wilmington doing vis-a-vis -vis North Carolina, how's Wilmington doing vis-a-vis -vis the U.S., but how are we doing versus the cities around the southeast that we consider to be our peer cities. Um, and this document wasn't intended, wasn't envisioned to be sort of a, a, a statement of what we have to do next. It was intended to be sort of informational to give you all this data and then after today we collectively as a community will decide what this stuff means and what we're going to do with it going forward. So peer cities, um, to back up a half step, to create a scorecard like this you really need to do two things up front. First of all you need to select the metrics you're going to use, uh, those numbers that you're going to track going forward. We're going to talk about that in detail in a second. Um, but the second thing you need to do is you need to try to figure out who your peer cities are. Uh, and so our task team set about uh, with the business of looking around for communities uh, that we could consider uh, peer cities and that would be helpful to measure ourselves against. For our, there are two categories of peer cities you'll see here. First is comparative, second is aspirational. Comparative means sort of true peer cities. Uh, aspirational means these aren't exactly peer cities of ours because they might have some important differences, but we know, we know them and we know they've been successful. So let's just take a look and see how we're doing vis-a-vis -vis those cities uh, from an aspirational standpoint. So for the comparative peer cities, we tried to look at population, <clears throat> population similarity, uh, proximity, geographic proximity. We tried to look at geographic characteristics, so you'll see a lot of port cities uh, in this list. And finally, familiarity, because if we put a bunch of cities on this uh, scorecard that none of us knew anything about, it wouldn't be nearly as helpful. And as I said earlier, for the aspirational cities, uh, we looked at familiarity. I think we're all familiar with Charleston, we're familiar with Raleigh, um, some proximity, and as I said, recent success. So that there they are, uh, Myrtle Beach, Asheville, Savannah, Mobile, Roanoke, Chattanooga, and Pensacola. These are uh, all cities that are roughly the same population as we are, especially if we look at ourselves as a Wilmington region that includes Brunswick County. Uh, we're going to do that. Adam will have more on that later, um, notwithstanding what the folks in D.C. might say. Um, these are all proximate to us. Uh, many of them have th some of the same uh, geographic uh, characteristics, and of course they're all familiar. All right. Key takeaways. Um, and here again, these are just a few thoughts. I think the, r the real key takeaways will come from you all as we talk about this going forward. But as we look at this data, which you'll see in this uh, scorecard, I think what we see is as it relates to employment and economic growth, uh, that's it. Yeah, um, we uh, we are improving in overall terms. Our local economy uh, is growing. 
Uh, but when we look at that economic growth on a per capita basis and take into account the fact that people continue to move here, which is without a doubt a good thing, uh, we see that on a per capita basis our economic growth is a bit flat. Um, put it another way, we're growing our local economy at about the same speed that we're adding people. Um, with respect to large versus small business, I think the data show that we are very good at creating small businesses in this community. I don't think there's any evidence that there are barriers, undue barriers to small business creation. You'll see our small business sector is proportionally much larger than our large business segment. And while in a lot of communities that's viewed as a real bonus, I think for us um, there are a couple different maybe contradictory messages that we need to take away from it. As for entrepreneurship, I think we have a good environment for entrepreneurship, again, as evidenced by our strong small business sector. Um, but we have a lot of opportunities to improve, especially in the area of innovation. And finally, um, we've got the obligatory reference to the film industry here. Really, it's an example of a high-skill, traded sector business um, that, for reasons that are largely out of our control, is uh, currently very much at risk. So those are the key takeaways, and I will turn it over to Dr. Jones for further discussion about the details. So good morning. I, I feel as though I have to admit that I'm a little embarrassed to be sitting up here this morning. Um, when Connie asked me if I would sit up here and talk with you all, I of course said yes. But I'm slightly embarrassed that I feel as though I'm sitting up here simply because I'm the last person to have touched the data. Um, to, to, to sit up here and take credit for this would really be inappropriate. This is really a team effort to, I mean, credit Connie for relentlessly herding cats on this project, Hal's constant questioning, uh, Ryan Beckner's uh, endless efforts and energy to chase down some of the initial data and learn what's out there, Beth Schrader's contributions, the list goes on and on. It's unbelievable what a team effort this was and from my perspective, it's been a very invigorating project to be a part of. I've really enjoyed it. It's great to be around people who care about their community as much as these folks do. Uh, so that being said, let's get to the fun stuff and let's talk about statistics for a couple <laughs> minutes. <laughs> All right, so as we go through the scorecard, the data is formatted as an index. And I, I guess that makes the data ultimately easier to interpret once we understand what an index is. So we need to think about what is an index. So this morning I had an opportunity, I was talking with Dean Burris and telling him about my latest workout and how sore my arms were. I set a new personal best for bench press at 50 pounds. I was, I was pretty proud of myself. Burris leans over and he says, <clears throat> Jones, that's not very good. That's like 25% of your body weight. I said, wait, that's not good? He said, no. An average person can do 75% of their body weight without any working out. So if you think about it, that's exactly what we've done with the data here, is we've taken it and we've first found the number that we're interested in. So this is my 50-pound bench press that I was so proud of. We then scaled it. So take 50 pounds, compare it to body weight, and then compare that to how others are doing. So that's what these indexes are. So the way the indexes are calculated is we take the local value, which is our number divided by either population or labor force or however we're scaling it, and then we take that statistic and we compare it to the national average, so how we're doing versus the nation. So how do we interpret the data then? So the numbers that come out are relative to the U.S. So that means if there's a value of 110, you go, wait, what does 110% mean? It's not really a percentage. It's a comparison to the national benchmark. So a value of 110 means we're doing 10% better than the nation. So contrary to what sports players say when they say they gave 110% today, that's not exactly what these numbers mean. These numbers are relative to the nation. All right, so that's, now that we have a little bit of an understanding what the numbers mean, where did they come from and what are some of the unique problems that we ran into? 
So one of the unique problems that we have is the, the federal government and the Office of Management and Budget change the way some of the areas are calculated or defined. So these areas are known as metropolitan statistical areas, which is sort of a fancy and more technical way for saying cities and counties that function together. So they come as metropolitan areas, micropolitan areas, metropolitan being larger. We could get into the details, but I'm probably already putting you to sleep. What's the important part about this and why is it a little bit difficult for us? So the Wilmington Metropolitan Area, or Metropolitan Statistical Area, MSA, has been redefined to include New Hanover County and Pender County. Brunswick County was removed from the Wilmington MSA and added to the Myrtle Beach MSA. So MSAs are areas where there is significant economic integration between the counties. <clears throat> I would imagine that there are some folks still coming over the bridge this morning, which I think is evidence that Brunswick County and New Hanover County definitely go together. Uh, the committee decided that we wanted Brunswick to be part of the Wilmington region. So as you go through the scorecard, you may see Wilmington referred to two ways, as the Wilmington region or as the Wilmington MSA. So the Wilmington region, what we did is initially our MSA was all three of the counties, Pender County, New Hanover County, and Brunswick County. And you had Myrtle Beach as its own separate county. Well, the feds took Brunswick County away from us and made it part of Myrtle Beach. We want it to be part of Wilmington. So we defined this Wilmington region, and we said we're going to include Brunswick County with us as well. So Brunswick County is part of the Myrtle Beach MSA in the data in the scorecard, and it's also part of the Wilmington region. So where we could add it back in, we did. Um, this was slightly problematic for some of the figures that are only available at the MSA level, such as gross domestic product. Uh, we did our best to estimate those. If you want to talk details of that, I'll be more than happy to put you to sleep one-on-one -on -one, as opposed to a large group. <laughs> All right, so why, why all this effort to try and put Brunswick back in, especially with gross domestic product? Well, it's a story about what are we trying to measure. So earlier we were told that what you can measure, you can manage. So we thought we would structure this scorecard by looking at the model for economic prosperity. So there are two ways you could go through sort of thinking about a pyramid, right? From the bottom up or from the top down. Well, the top being the economic outputs seemed more like our goal and our objective, so let's start there. So thinking about the outcomes, we're interested in economic output, employment, and earnings. So economic output, sometimes also referred to as gross regional product or gross domestic product, is really our best measure of economic activity. It's how much stuff do we make in this community. So that was one of our measures that we're sort of focusing on and targeting. And ultimately, that's kind of an abstract measure. Another one that's very important for us to look at is earnings and income, right? We're trying to get a feel for what's the quality of life like for citizens in this community and how do we measure it. So those are our outcomes that we were interested in. Those outcomes are created by looking at sort of this middle part of the pyramid, which is the environment that facilitates our inputs turning into the outputs. So this middle part of the pyramid includes the industrial composition of the community, it includes our social and cultural environment, and our infrastructure. So it's how well can we take our inputs of our people, our human capital, right? Their skills, their innovative activity and ideas, um, the entrepreneurial environment, right? the risk-taking creative spirit, and then finally our quality of place, and combine all of those together to deliver a quality of life for our people. So that was the model that we said we were going to look at with this top part, the economic development outcomes being sort of the objective, and the bottom piece being our inputs that we would really focus on with our four indices. So that's how the scorecard is structured. All right, so now we're done with the boring part. Hal can get to the exciting part and talk about how are we doing. Okay, so how are we doing? And for 
orientation purposes, this is the top of the pyramid. These are the outcomes. And we're doing this a little bit reverse because of the way the scorecard is written. Uh, but of course, we all know that typically the foundation of a pyramid is what's going to lead to the, uh, the uh, top of it, the vertex, I guess. Um, we're going to start with the top and go down. These are the economic development outcomes. Um, you can all see them in your book. I don't know that any of you can read them from where you sit. Uh, I can't at least. Maybe that means I'm ready for Carolina Bay myself. Um, <laughs> but at any rate, um, just to do a quick tour through here and give some thoughts. Uh, for starting at the top left here, we have gross regional product growth for the 2010-2014 time period. This is a five-year measurement of how, big, how much bigger our regional economy has gotten as compared to our peer cities. And as you can see there, our local economy has grown by just over 10%. Um, that in and of itself compares pretty favorably to our peer cities. Charleston and Raleigh are ahead of, you, of us. Myrtle Beach is ahead of us. But we beat all of our other comparative cities. The next one over is the same statistic, but with population growth factored in. And so what you see there is when we factor in the, the fact that people have continued to move to Wilmington, um, our GRP growth looks a little bit less desirable. Uh, we are closer to the bottom of the scale there than we are to the top. The next uh, graph over is employment growth, again, for the five-year period. Uh, this is not a per capita type figure. This is uh, overall employment growth. You can see 5.6% puts us in about the middle of the pack. Uh, just a, a quick uh, pause here to uh, point out what some of you may have already seen, which is on this third graph, Mobile is in dead last place. In uh, the second graph, Mobile is in first place. And you're wondering, well, gosh, how can that be? And the answer is, uh, if you look at Mobile's population growth, it is almost flat. Um, in this five-year period, uh, about 3,000 people were added to Mobile's population. That's what Brunswick County will do in one year. Um, so, Brunswick, uh, so Mobile's population is flat, but they have managed to grow their uh, gross regional product in a way that means for the average person in Mobile, uh, standard of living has increased because GRP has uh, increased faster than their population growth. Uh, down at the bottom, we have per capita income growth and average annual pay growth. Those are similar measures. You can see we're middle of the pack uh, in those two. The primary difference, I think, and Adam will correct me if I'm wrong there, is per capita income growth takes into account non-wage income like dividends. Um, we have a, a strong retirement demographic here in, in our area, which we all know is a wonderful thing. That comes with it some, uh, some dividend and non-wage income of that sort, which is, again, a great thing to have. But if you look at the fifth chart, you see that in terms of wages people in the working segment are making, uh, we're trailing behind many of our peer cities. So with that, we will talk a little bit about a concept called traded sector. All right, so thinking about the traded sector, uh, again, I'm a fairly simple man. I think in terms of analogies and stories that I can relate to. So as I was trying to figure out, how do I explain the traded sector? I was thinking about this while I was on a bicycle ride, and I had a slow leak in my rear tire. So it was slowly going down. I'd stop, put a little bit more air in it, ride for another 15 minutes, stop, put a little bit more air in it. The whole time, my wife criticizing me, just change the stinking tire. I'm like, no, the new tube, never mind. So anyway, it's this process of going along, losing air, and putting air into the tire. Well, the traded sector is our economic equivalent to that. So we're always losing some income or wealth to other communities as we travel, as we order things off of Amazon, as we send birthday cards with $20 bills in them to our nephews. Right? That's money that's leaving the community. If you want to really overkill the analogies and the cliches, this is a, a bucket with some holes in it. Right? It's leaking. So that's normal for most communities, or all communities. What's important for us to look at is what does the income side look like? 
what's the stream that's filling the bucket? How much air is going into my bicycle tire? And hopefully that's more than is going out. So to measure that, we looked at what's called the traded sector. So the traded sector we compare to uh, the local sector, the local sector being goods that are made and sold locally, the traded sector being goods that are made in one location and sold somewhere else. Um, so how do we envision that? Think of automobiles, right? An automobile dealership is a local industry. Who are their customers? Their customers are people in the community versus automobile assembly is a traded sector. Right? VWs that are assembled in Chattanooga are sold where? All over the entire country, not just in Chattanooga. So that VW factor is bringing income into the community. So what we wanted to do is look at the traded sector for Wilmington. Say, all right, how are we doing? Where is our income coming from and how do we compare to our peers? So how are we doing on the traded sector? Uh, Here's uh, our first um, index. Uh, what you can see here is that uh, we've got room for improvement in the traded sector. Uh, the national average here is set at the top of the dial at, at, at 100. We score 62. That's actually a little bit less than what we would, would have scored in 2010. Uh, you can see that a lot of our peer cities are also on this side of the national average with us. Um, that is probably a reflection of the fact that our peer cities are in the southeast, and the southeast has never been uh, known quite as much as the northeast and the midwest for manufacturing, and manufacturing is almost 100% traded sector. Uh, Mobile and Chattanooga do very well here. Uh, they, as Adam said, Chattanooga uh, has uh, the automobile industry. They also have the uh, steel industry. Uh, Chattanooga has been a strong manufacturing city for a hundred years and continues to be. Mobile's had some recent successes as well. So what this tells us, I think, is that we, um, we need to keep looking at ways to create either uh, the production of goods or the provision of services here in Wilmington uh, that are bought by people outside of Wilmington. Uh, it's a pretty simple concept. A uh, little harder to figure out exactly how to pull it off, but uh, it's something that I think uh, we'll keep track of as we go forward. All right, so we will now go to the bottom part of the pyramid. Um, there are uh, four indexes here we're going to talk to you very briefly about. Uh, again, the bottom part of the pyramid you would think uh, over time would result in good results at the top of the pyramid. Uh, the first uh, index at the bottom of the pyramid is what we call human capital. You're asking, okay, what's that? Is that what it sounds like? And the answer is yes, it's what it sounds like. Um, as we say in the scorecard itself, uh, it's crucial for any city that wants to grow or any region that wants to grow uh, to produce, attract, and retain talent. Because business needs talent to grow. That uh, talent can either uh, come to your business through organic commu uh, community growth or it can come to you uh, because it's been attracted to your community from elsewhere. But if you don't have talent, you can't expect to grow. So how do we do on human capital? We do pretty well on human capital. Uh, as you can see here, uh, based on the, uh, based on the uh, indicators that we use and that most communities use, only Raleigh outpaces Wilmington. Uh, from the standpoint of human capital. Uh, Charleston and Roanoke are, all, are also strong uh, competitors and we are all uh, in excess of the U.S. average or the index set at 100. And Adam will talk to you about some of the indicators that make up human capital. So our strong performance in, uh, I, I know you can't necessarily read the numbers on the screen, I think that's a good thing. Well, <laughs> that keeps us from getting bogged down in the details. What I want you to look at on these is look for the highlighted bar, which is the Wilmington MSA or Wilmington region. Because if we're comparing to our peer cities or our aspirants, what we want to know is how do we do compared to them? So the number is probably less important and our position may be a little bit more important. All right, so what's driving our good performance on the human capital index is 
uh, primarily being driven by the large number of knowledge workers in the community. So knowledge workers has a specific definition, but you can think of it as employment that requires a specific skill set. So these are going to be doctors, lawyers, uh, engineers, etc. So those folks that have a very specific defined set of skills. We have a very well educated workforce in this region. And that shows up when you look at the next two statistics, high school graduates and college graduates. We're doing better than most of our peers. And if you look at the last one, the employment rate, you go, ooh, wait a minute, we're middle of the pack on that. But I think that's okay. So if you look at the employment rate, first thing you notice is there isn't a whole lot of variation to it. It's a very tight grouping, and we would expect employment nationwide to tend to the same levels. If you have a large available workforce somewhere, high unemployment, um, probably going to see firms move in to take advantage of that, right? As wages come down, firms are going to move in, put those people to work. As the labor force begins to tighten and wages start pushing up, firms are going to look elsewhere. So we would expect the market to, in economic terms, tend towards equilibrium. In other words, the communities are going to tend to cluster together and move together. It's the first three where we can really differentiate ourselves. And I think we've done a relatively good job of that. There's a lot of talent in this community, a lot to be proud of and excited about for the future. The next index is the innovative index. Uh, so what is that? As we say in the scorecard, innovation is critical to developing a region's competitive advantage. <laughs> Uh, so what does that mean exactly? The way I think of it is a community can either succeed by doing the old things better than any other community or by coming up with new things to do. Um, new things often are where you can add prosperity and increase your standard of living. So this index attempts to measure how well we are vis-a-vis -vis our peer cities at creating those new things, at being innovative. Um, and uh, so how are we doing? Well, uh, we've got room for improvement here, uh, but it comes with some caveats. Um, Adam will talk about some of those in a second. Let me say something about this. We score 53 versus a national average of 100. You can see, however, that there's one outlier, well, you probably can't see, but in your book at least you can see that Raleigh is off the charts good. Uh, and the Raleigh MSA, by the way, includes Wake County. It does not include Durham and Chapel Hill, but it does include part of RTP. Um, this data is pretty chunky, um, by which I mean you're going to see great disparities uh, between cities because it has a lot to do with grant funding, sort of stuff that can sometimes be one-off. Um, we uh, Actually, compared to our southeastern peer cities, don't do very poorly. Uh, we don't do well versus the national average, but uh, we do better against a lot of the uh, industries we compete with. All right, so th this is a very difficult area to try and measure. Um, I, I like to tell an anecdote about a gentleman by the name of Keith Tantlinger. Who you guys go, who is that? Well, his obituary showed up in the New York Times several years ago, and it said that he created a new corner for a box. Like a corner for a box. Why is that important? Why did that put him in the New York Times? Well, it turns out it's a very important box. Keith was experimenting in his garage and figured out how to improve shipping containers so that they can be stacked on ships. So you're talking about one person whose idea quietly pursued in their garage, revolutionized in industry and potentially global economics. So one person, well, how do you capture that? How do you find that? And that's where it's difficult to do. So we end up with these sort of chunky statistics that, while not perfect, are our best attempt to get a feel for how much of that kind of activity is going on in the community. So the first one we use is employment and technical positions. So try and get a feel for how many people are being paid to work on these kind of ideas and to think creatively in very technical areas. So without going through the list of all the positions, you could almost think of this as those employed in the STEM fields. Uh, and Wilmington does relatively well there, especially compared to our smaller southeastern peers. Uh, the next category is 
different types of grant funding. And this is the one that's extremely volatile, kind of chunky. It moves from year to year uh, uh, by a considerable amount. And if you're talking about, say, UNCW pulling in grants on the order of 10 to $12 million a year, one big grant changes this number tremendously. So this number moves around, and if you look at it, there's a huge variance in it between the bottom and the top. Um, so it, it's not a perfect measure, but it's one of the best measures we've got. So we're looking for measures that we can compare across areas, and I think this one works okay for getting a feel for how successful are we at getting grants and funding this innovative exploratory activity in the community. Uh, patents issued, we do pretty well on. That's maybe a little bit better measure, uh, a little bit more, maybe not better, but a little bit more consistent measure across time. Uh, and then finally, science-related graduate students. We have a fair number of students in our community that's future talent, especially compared to our southeastern peers. The next index in the scorecard is Entrepreneurial Environment Index. Uh, put simply, uh, you, you want to have a community where there are no uh, undue burdens on small business creation. You want to have a, a community where people feel like they can start their own business and try to succeed on their own if they're so inclined. So how do we do? We do pretty well uh, here uh, in entrepreneurship. Um, as you can see here, we are really uh, ahead of all of our peer cities. Um, there's a caveat that comes with that, which we'll get to at, after Adam speaks. but as it relates to the U.S. average and our peer cities, we're doing very well on entrepreneurial environment. And so what's driving our strong performance on the entrepreneurial environment is the large number of businesses that we have in this community uh, relative to the population <laughs> and labor force, and specifically the fact that many of them are small businesses. Folks in Wilmington, for various reasons, are willing to go out and try and make a go of it on their own. That's a very entrepreneurial spirit. Um, I, I think there, there's positives to this as well as some concerns, but the positive is we have a lot of risk takers in this community, hopefully prudent risks, <laughs> but a lot of people who are willing to give it a go, and that speaks well for the future and opportunity, especially if we can help support them uh, in that growth. Where we lack a little bit is the business services sector. And that reflects um, services for businesses. So this could be support services from a headquarters, but it's also containing what you might think of more traditionally as support services, such as payroll service firms, consulting firms, design and engineering firms. Um, so we, we don't score quite as well on that metric as some of our other peer cities, which is largely a reflection of the fact that a lot of the businesses in this community are small businesses that are getting going, they're in the local sector, not the traded sector, and we haven't yet developed the demand for a large business services sector. So as Adam points out, uh, if, if our small businesses were as involved in the traded sector as we would all like to see them on average, we would expect to see the business services um, ranking be higher. And the, the fact that business services is ranked lower is a reflection of our sort of non-traded orientation in this town, one that, um, that we probably ought to look at trying to move away from where we can. And that's where, if I can jump in real quickly, yesterday when we were talking about the statistics, we of course went off on a tangent on this, thinking about, well, how can we support these entrepreneurs? And that turned into a rather lengthy discussion and I think is a great place for this group to have a discussion over the future of what can we do as a community. The objective of the scorecard was just to put the facts out there and not necessarily to answer every question, but to help frame some of the questions and then hope that your ingenuity and creativity can help solve some of them. So the uh, final index that we're going to talk to you about is quality of place. Um, what is it? Um, well, it's why we live here, right? But why is it important to business? Uh, well, it's important to business because in this day and age, highly educated uh, workers aren't bound by location. Uh, we all see that. We live in a very mobile society. 
not only can people largely live where they want to live, but they can live somewhere and actually report to work in another location through technology. So um, quality place is more important now than it ever has been. So how do we do on this one? Well, you all live here, so you're not surprised by this, uh, but we do very well. Uh, we do what very well according to the indicators that we use and other places like Charleston use. Uh, as you can see there, we, uh, our index number is 124 compared to uh, the U.S. average of 100, uh, and that uh, puts us in a very favorable position vis-a-vis -vis our peer cities. And Adam will tell us about the indicators. Do we really need to talk about this? <laughs> we all know Wilmington's a great place to, to live, right? We love living here. All right, so how do we do compared to our peers? Well, if we look at culture and recreation, which is the number of, uh, or the percentage of uh, the workforce in this community employed in culture and recreation related jobs, we do pretty well. Myrtle Beach is leading the pack. I mean, they're, they're killing it there. And several people say, well, is Myrtle Beach really the center of culture and recreation? Well, th think about what Myrtle Beach is, right? It's a place that people go to vacation and uh, recreate. It, it may or may not be everybody's taste, but they've done a nice job of carving out their industry and their area, right? So that's sort of what they focus in. Healthcare access, we score very well. Uh, the next two, when it comes to crime rate and rush hour travel times, when you look at those, we want to be at the top of the list. Don't be concerned that, wait, that's a large number. So Connie told me I'm not allowed to tell you that these are reverse coded because that's <laughs> jargon. And nobody wants to hear reverse coded in the morning, so don't use reverse coded. There we go. I said it all three times, Connie. <laughs> All right, so what does that mean? That means the numbers have simply been flipped around such that a higher number means that rush hour commute times are relatively low. We don't have a problem with it. And that crime rate, you want a higher number, meaning a lower level of crime. They've just been um, inverted to make them match the other statistics. So we do OK. Um, I think in terms of rush hour, I complain about traffic as much as the next person, but when I really get to complaining about it, several people remind me that I used to live in Atlanta, and an hour and a half to get somewhere was not unusual. Um, so here our rush hour and commute times are pretty good. Now, it's not a perfect measure of congestion. Right? So this isn't just traffic. This is also capturing availability of houses and proximity to work and the fact that in many large cities, it's a story of drive until you can afford it, versus Wilmington has a very unique uh, property market in that our values are often driven by water access to, if you can hear it, that causes home prices to be considerably larger. But it leads to a, a different dynamic in terms of the distribution of housing. It's not this central core and then you drive out to find inexpensive housing. It's spread out a little bit differently in Wilmington, which allows for shorter commute times and a more evenly distributed traffic pattern. And then finally, the last metric we looked at was air quality. So this is measured as the percentage of days with air quality measured as good. So this is a flat level defined by um, the EPA, and they count the number of days that count as good. Uh, I think the next one down was acceptable and then poor, and we do very well on this metric. So I think that sums up what we already knew, that Wilmington's a great place to live. We have a nice quality of life. So uh, real quickly, again, the key takeaways, and these are just our key takeaways. They don't need to be your key takeaways. Uh, I, I hope everybody will come up with their own takeaways from this. But employment and economic growth, we are growing. Our employment base is growing. We need to be concerned about how that growth compares to our population growth. Uh, large business versus small business. There's no doubt that people are not afraid to <coughs> start small businesses in this town. That's a good thing. Uh, but we need to think about, since small businesses tend to be non-traded sector businesses, we need to think about whether uh, there's an opportunity to, uh, to grow more in the traded sector space. 
entrepreneurship, we have a good environment, we've got a good base with our university and our community college, uh, but we can keep moving forward on that as well. And then finally, everybody's favorite example of the traded, uh, uh, traded industry business, that's the film industry, and uh, we all want that to succeed here. So, with that, Ms. Majorette. So, we have a few minutes for some questions. We've got Ryan and Kelsey of the audience. They'll bring a microphone to you. We're recording this, so we want the sound quality to be good. Does anybody have a question? You have to be really smart to ask a question. And there's John Hennett, of course. <laughs> I noticed in the data some of the um, information metrics swap switch from Wilmington region to Wilmington MSA, and I'm just curious why we didn't get both numbers. How do you know does Brunswick County really dilute our statistic, or what, or could we not just see both numbers, or does it not change it significantly? <clears throat> so uh, it, it's really an availability problem. Um, the data that's available at the county level, we were able to aggregate up to create this Wilmington region by simply pulling at the county level and adding it together. Unfortunately, some of the data, especially the data from the BLS, is only available at an MSA level, which means when the uh, MSAs were redefined, we no longer get Brunswick County data on its own. It's part of Myrtle Beach. Um, for some of those statistics, there is literature and uh, research out there about how to back out an individual county. For some of them, there's not. On the ones that we couldn't back out the Brunswick data from the Myrtle Beach data, we decided just leave it alone. We'll use the MSA instead of this potentially inaccurate figure backed out from the MSA. So it's really just an availability problem. Uh, if we could, we would have it all at the regional level for sure. Jason Wheeler. Morning, guys. Um, my question has to do with uh, housing. Um, one of the things that we've heard lately in the news last week, I believe, um, is affordability. And I'm curious on a traded sector basis, there's a lot of issues of bringing in people maybe that have lower wages in some of those sectors and then the affordability of the housing here. So I'm curious, where does housing impact these numbers? And where do you see that as far as the data? Is that something we even need to look at going forward? Well, Jason, I'm not, I'm not sure we, uh, you know, with respect to traded versus non-traded, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that these data reveal anything in particular there on the housing question. I will say, if you look at um, sort of workforce housing from the standpoint of wanting to attract young, talented workers, um, I think uh, we're actually the future is fairly bright uh, in one sense at least. If there are people outside of our region, young people, talented people who want to come live near the river, they're going to have plenty of opportunities in the next five years because there's a lot of residential growth in downtown. Now that's not a picture of the entire community, uh, but if uh, if if our the growth of our young entrepreneurial uh, population has been uh, stunted at all by a lack of what we might call cool housing, um, we're in the process of solving that problem, I think. In terms of how the employment in the industry is counted, it's counted as local employment. Uh, the housing, at least my house, was made where it sits now. Um, so it's built here, sold here, so that employment is counted as part of the local sector. Um, in terms of trying to match uh, housing prices to wages and affordability, I think that's probably a very good discussion to have, but uh, probably a long discussion as well, and I, I'm glad you brought that up. But Jason, also just say that you know, we want to keep doing this. <laughs> so we're going to add new matrices, new indicators next year, the year after. We want to improve this and make it better every year. That may be one of the things we want to include in next year's report. We just couldn't get to it this year. Yeah. Skip's got one, and then we'll have one more after that. Thank you. It's obvious that we're in a dynamic environment. We're not the only town, community, region seeking traded sector jobs, large industries, whether it's service or manufacturing. What can we, the stakeholders in this region, do to encourage the development, to foster economic development, economic growth? What can we do 
because Wilmington is a beautiful town. We all know that, but so is every town on this, in this, in every competitive, comparative city. So what can we do to stick our head up, or what can we do to reduce barriers that may currently exist? Well, Skip, I'll take a, a one stab at that. I, I think that it's important for us to sort of take stock of, of, of what kind of community we, we are, what our strengths and weaknesses are. Um, I don't have the exact figures, but I, I used to live in Greensboro. And if you live in Greensboro or you have a business in Greensboro and you drive three hours in any direction, you might be able to shake hands with uh, 12 million people. Um, we can't say that about Wilmington because, you know, even though it's a wonderful place, you know, half of our neighbors are fish here, right? Um, so from, a, from the standpoint of distribution or logistics, uh, it's going to be difficult for us to compete with areas that are more centrally located unless there, it, it's distribution or logistics related to something we have that they don't. Uh, so, for example, we have an international seaport. Greensboro does not have that. Uh, so I think that's the sort of thing we need to take stock here and we need to recognize there are some things that we're well situated to do, other things that we aren't, um, and let's focus on trying to improve those where we have a, a competitive advantage. There are industry clusters as well. This is part of what's going on in the community now, partly as a result of uh, Jay Garner's report, um, where we already have a, a, a type of business here, for whatever reason it seems to be thriving, the CRO business is an example of this. Um, so there's already something about the community, even if we don't know exactly what it is, there's something about this community that the CRO business likes. Uh, and so I think it pays for us to identify those clusters that do well here and try to do what we can to grow those. If, if I can quickly add to that, so let me take off my regional econ hat and put back on my old economic developer hat. Uh, we've got a great base of small businesses in the community, which is fantastic because the small business owners, as you all know, care about their employees. They're involved in the community, and we want to try and nurture and grow those. So if we think of half of our neighbors as being fish, we could also think of half of our neighbors as being the rest of the world. Right? So how do we tap into that? So I jotted a couple notes on this. Let's take advantage of the fact that we have a lot of risk takers in the community. These are folks that understand how to find niches and how to uh, identify opportunities. They've now built the skills for how to run a small business. Let's take some of these retailers and local businesses and let's turn them into importers. Let's help them grow their business. Let's nurture this group that's already here. Um, let's find the service men in our community who have ideas for products to fix problems and tie them in with the maker spaces and the students at UNCW and take advantage of the opportunities to help them launch new products and grow their businesses here in the town. So I think that there's a lot to think about and the port means that we have better access to the billions of people in the world than Greensboro does. And one thing I'll just add, I know Connie's we got you out of here, but you know, Skip brings up a good point. And with the weakness in the traded sector that we've got here, just a statistic that we've talked about a lot internally, and some of you have heard me mention before, our industrial base in New Hanover County in about 1975 was about 25% of our tax base. In 2000, it was about 11% of our tax base. Today, it's about 4.5% of our tax base. So that erosion in the industrial sector is re directly reflected in these traded sector employment indices. If we, can, if we can bring in more good paying jobs in the industrial sector, it'll raise this up and it'll float the entire boat um, more effectively. Great, and we've got one other question over here. Good morning, I'm Clifford Barnett. I'm from Warner Temple Church. Um, I noticed in the um, Human Capital Index, something I didn't see, and I'm just wondering, I know you said you're gonna put some more things um, on the table, but um, my thought was, is there any data about what's happening with kids, let's say, in that first 2,000 days? Because one of the things that we understand is that if we do a more early um, education and have more facilities available for kids, um, that that'll help us in the long run later on. And I noticed we started with high school, but I was just wondering, had that, had that been considered? Well, I don't, that, that's a, a great point, and of course you don't, if you don't, 
do that sort of thing uh, right off the bat with kids, then you're not going to have good results later on down the line. Um, it's not something that we um, attempted to measure here. Um, it's it's cer certainly something we can look at in the future, but uh, it's, uh, you know, if you don't get that part right, then you're going to have all, all this other stuff's not going to make much of a difference. Absolutely. Great. Hey guys, these people will stay behind. We'll all stay behind and answer any questions that you may have. I want to thank y'all so much for coming out. There was a lot of data to go through. We're very lucky to be surrounded by such smart people. Um, I've learned a lot. I want to thank our sponsors again, Duke Energy, Carolina Bay at Autumn Hall, BB&T and Corning. Thank y'all so much. Have a good afternoon. Morning.